I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, who is going to introduce the panelists. Uh, this is uh, this panel name is starting with yourself. Self care, mental health, and the arts. And your moderator is Trisha Knowles. She's Wavelength's marketing director. She's also a, an artist and community builder in Kingston. puts on lots of events in the Kingston, Ontario community, uh, including her own uh, collective Calliope. And uh, she's also someone who has had some experience with mental health, and this topic really resonated with her. So please welcome Trisha Knowles. Hi, everyone. Um, is everyone comfortable over here? Does anyone want to get up so and move towards this way? So I don't mind back here. to you. So I just want to apologize. I'm on a cozy couch. I don't think that they want me. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be willing. It's fair. It's fair. Okay. So as Johnny mentioned, uh, I wear and have worn many hats in the music and arts industry uh, for more than 20 years now uh, in different capacities. And being in this industry is not a nine to five job, no matter what role you have. It takes its toll on your relationships with your family, with your friends, with your lovers, your partners. Um, and for me personally, contributed a lot to a lot of social anxiety. So I, uh, I suffer from an anxiety disorder. So a lot of social anxiety coming out of being the small town celebrity <laughs> as a, a radio host for 14 years and going through a, a lot of stuff with imposter syndrome. When I left that career and started a new one, uh, I've dealt with PTSD. I deal with intergenerational trauma. Therapy is something that everybody should do on a regular basis, and there are ways that you can do that if you don't have insurance, and we're gonna talk about all of that stuff tonight. So, uh, as he mentioned, this is a topic very near and dear to my heart, and I thank you all for being here tonight and sharing space with us. So, uh, just before I introduce our panel, I, I wanted to mention uh, this really cool study that I had read uh, before I do, how many folks here tonight are musicians? Can I just get a show of hands? Okay, uh, visual artists, performing artists, okay, arts administrators? Just a couple of us, okay. <laughs> uh, so being a professional artist is thrilling, it's rewarding, it's filled with possibilities, but it also has a lot of potential pitfalls. So, especially if you're a musician. Uh, in May, a digital distribution platform called Record Union shared the results of a survey conducted with about 1,500 musicians, and they found that 73% of independent music makers suffer from symptoms of mental illness, mental health, anxiety, depression. Those are the most commonly experienced negative emotions, if you will, in, in relation to music creation. So um, the percentage of those that were a part of this study that felt the music industry is providing healthy working conditions. Uh, let's see a show of hands again. How many people thought half of them? 40%? 30? 20? Yeah. 19% said that uh, there were healthy working conditions involved in the industry. So. We all live and we work and we play in these environments and these environments aren't necessarily in line with a healthy lifestyle. So there are things that we do need to do to make sure that our self-care is uh, prioritized. So we're gonna explore some ways to do that tonight. So first I'd like to introduce you to Ariane Tong. She is a comedian, so I'm expecting a lot of don't expect <laughs> tonight. Don't put your expectations on. <laughs> Kidding. She's also a writer uh, for Yo Homo, the Beaverton website. She hosts group therapy podcast. It's like, I know who you are. <laughs> uh, she interviews other comedians about mental health issues with a therapist present. So if you haven't listened, to the podcast, it's hilarious. Comedians so, are famous as stable people. Yeah, so. I started listening in preparation for this panel. I can't stop listening to it now, so highly recommend. Uh, she also hosts an associative comedy show called Freudian Slip First Mondays, uh, held at Side Street Bar, where the comics riff off random images from the internet. Uh, she needs one more hour of sleep a night, yeah. just one. 
<laughs> and yes, she knows she should try meditation. <laughs> it's my best bio that I've ever written. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, if you're on Insta, she is aloha.tong, and her tweets are summer of tong. So please welcome Arian Tong. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm on the board. <laughs> But I didn't use my influence to get here. <laughs> Just her jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Next we have uh, Sarah Hagerman, aka Mary Moxie. She is a passionate singer-songwriter and a music business professional from Oshawa. Since graduating from music business management program at Durham College, she has been striving to open doors that allow her to be active in supporting the health and wellness of the Canadian music community. Sarah works endlessly to build positive influence on the community surrounding issues such as substance abuse, inclusivity, and mental health. Her role as the Industry Relations Coordinator at Unison Benevolent Fund helps Sarah work towards her goals by coordinating partnerships, communications, and event coordination between Unison and other organizations like Wavelength, uh, and also doing events nationally as well. So please welcome. Thank you. Hi, guys. Would you prefer Sarah or Mary? Sarah is totally cool. Don't yeah. need to do it interchangeably? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and finally, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Anita Shack. Um, Anita is a Toronto-based chiropractor. She has 35 years of experience using uh, chiropractic, acupuncture, and craniosacral therapy to facilitate change and wellness for her patients. Uh, she sees a variety of artists and performers from all our bunch of artistic disciplines at the Alan Melka Green Artist Health Center. Uh, if you don't know about the Artist Health Center, it's at the Toronto Western Hospital, which is a huge deal that this exists in a hospital. Uh, she's also a published researcher, international speaker, and a teacher, but that's not it. goes on. A former modern dancer and independent chore choreographer. Uh, so this allows her to be sensitive to the specific stresses and sensibilities of artists. So she has a, a particular interest in the body-mind connection and combining earth-based and spiritual healing paradigms combined, uh, those ancient traditions combined with evidence-based science. Uh, so it's really a, a very rich and full <laughs> career path that you've been on. <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Anita Shack. Yeah. All right, let's dig in. So, I think that for the purpose of tonight's conversation, it would be really great to explore a little bit of the terminology that's used. So, uh, sometimes you will read articles or you will see talks that use mental health and mental illness interchangeably. So, I would really love to hear from each of our panelists on... I guess what the term mental health encompasses for you as an umbrella term, if you could differentiate a little bit between those two terms, just so as we move forward tonight, everyone is on the same page when we use the term mental health. Yeah. Or self-care too yeah. would be a great one. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, can you hear me okay? I don't know if this Closer. is on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. I was a dancer, not a singer. Okay, <laughs> we're all good. Um, mental health, I think health, mental health is a part of overall health, so we can, we can separate things a little bit to understand them. Um, I think that mental health has to do with everything that we, that we feel, that we think, the way that we behave, how we interact, how we communicate, that's all under the umbrella of mental health, or the segment of our health that is focused on those things. And I think it's um, really there's a continuum of how we are with that. And certainly through a life, we have challenges and times when we're, we're stressed and times when we're anxious and times when we're depressed. It's really about what is our resilience? How do we have problems but cope and continue on? That, that is kind of a way of measuring where you're at. So mental health, uh, you know, we, we could focus on the health part. It doesn't mean we're always happy and confident and, and have no problems. It's really how we're, how we're living our daily lives. And I think that 
mental health certainly is a continuum, just like health is. You can have symptoms, you can have no symptoms, you can have health, you can have wellness, and you can have, um, if your mental health is not good, it can be, you know, it's a, it's a good place to start looking at it and looking at self-care, or even if it's fine, it's a good place. You don't go this way down the continuum. Um, you know, where we get, it's a, it's a little bit more extreme. It might be labeled as a disorder, and then it might eventually be called an illness. And at that point, um, you know, different interventions are needed. So I think it's really variations on a theme. There are certainly pathological conditions that create illness and, and uh, chemical imbalances and things like that. But I think in terms of mental health, it's a part of health just like we know what physical health is and things that we should and do or do not do for physical health. Um, mental health is to be viewed that way as well. That's my take. That, that is a, ooh, hey. That is, that is a really good thing that um, part, being part of my role with Unison is breaking down that, like how mental health and physical health is two separate things. Like they're very much so connected. Um, but to answer the question, like mental health to me is ex exactly how you put it, is my day-to-day -day routine almost. Like, did I get out of bed this morning? <laughs> like, you know, simple things like that. And, you know, I, I kind of like this. This is also a kind of a new thing for me, like, dip, you know, separating mental illness and mental health. And for, you know, say, for example, I have PTSD and depression. That is completely separate with how I deal with it, Right. Um, so yeah, you totally hit the nail on the head. Like that's, I, I just agree with everything you say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also agreed. You like really summed it up. Um, yeah. uh, mental health. I think the like, people think that you're either mentally healthy or either mentally ill, but really it's just a sum of the actions that you take to like take care of yourself, I think. And it's like just the same way you may be born hereditary with certain, um, challenges and like everyone's made different right it's all subjective but it's just like how individually you take care of yourself and you you know am I doing something that's going to help my overall mental health and like do I feel good about myself my confidence like what are those things to me that are going to help my overall health and like things can happen in your everyday life like situations can can arise that challenge your mental health, like certain, like having a parent die or, you know, somebody in your family has an illness and those things can bring up feelings of being men mentally, I guess, I I ill, right? Um, like not, not, well. not un well, yeah, 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 exactly. And so it's up to you to, how do you build into your day the routines to help you? get back to a, a place where you individually feel mentally healthy. So that is a really great segue because I'd love to know how each of you uh, really engage in your own artistic practices. So I know for myself, uh, Johnny mentioned that I make art and I have an art collective. So it's really hard for depression to sink its fangs in when I'm paper mashing a giant puppet head. <laughs> 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 or I'm writing a script for a show about, you know, embracing the light or gratitude. Um, and so going through those artistic practices, I mean, it's no secret that engaging in them has, has helped us for eons. So I'd love to know how engaging in your own artistic practices has helped you. And if you find that act of creating and writing music or comedy or creating a choreography um, or performing really helps you navigate through your own personal mental health journey. Uh, yeah, um, for me, comedy-wise and just writing-wise, I think that y we wouldn't be doing the arts if we didn't find it therapeutic in some way. It's like your thoughts coming out into the world and that feels really good. Uh, so when you're not producing stuff like that, it does mess with your mental health because you feel stuck. And when I, when I feel the worst about myself, uh, I, I am not putting things out into the world and, and not expressing myself through comedy or writing or something like that and so I think that just you know building things in to push yourself to you know we feel self-conscious that people won't accept what we have to say in our thoughts because it's so personal to us 
but you know, just pushing yourself to actually go out, go out to the open mics, even though they're horrible most of the time, and <laughs> you know, you're being judged directly on what's coming out of your brain. Um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> um, yeah, just kind of overcoming those things. Like sometimes it can go really well, and you feel so good about yourself, but the things that happen afterwards, if it doesn't go well, is how can I make myself feel less terrible right now? And like get the courage to go out and do it again uh, and like bring myself back to the reasons why I want to do it in the first place because I will feel even more terrible if I don't do it. And uh, so that's one thing, but also just taking care of yourself and your confidence and, and like what do I need to do to make myself feel better personally? Maybe if it has nothing to do with writing or whatever, maybe I need to go and just like take a bath or something and like just reaffirm to myself that this was only just one experience out of like a thousand that I'll have and what does it teach me and like reflect on that experience. So I think that sometimes we just get, spir we spiral and we, we think the worst <laughs> possible case scenario after something like a bad performance uh, but it's really just in the grand scheme of things, it's not it's not the end of the world. So just taking precautions and like maybe thinking ahead of time, like if this goes wrong, what are the things that I will do to help me get back on track? So, you know, you won't feel like spun out or, or like lost uh, for as long a time as, you know, if you didn't have something prepared. So like what I do now is like, okay, I go home and I like, before I even think about a negative, <laughs> like a negative set that I did, I'll just sort of like, okay, I'm gonna just not do this tonight and like tackle it tomorrow and then book in into my calendar a few things that I need to do to help myself feel better confidence wise that are good for me. And then I'll talk to, about it with a friend or like my girlfriend and like, you know, make myself feel better, you know? Yeah. 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 I, and you know what? And I really love the point of always going back to your original purpose because it's so hard being a creator. It's your job and it's also your release too, you know? And so, so sometimes having those two things connected can be really hard. It's kind of like working with your partner or something, you know, like it, it's constant connection. But for, for me personally, like, you know, write, writing music and, and creation is recovery. And it's um, a way to, to understand myself better so I can and then eventually, you know, it's also a way of giving back too. Like uh, us as artists and creators, it's our way of giving back to someone else who might uh, see your message and, and feel it. Um, but yeah, for me, like if I didn't write music, then I would just have like pent up emotions, right? And I wouldn't be able to release them properly. And it's just a good, and sometimes you have to separate the whole job and creation thing. And like you said, really, schedule out your days like organize yourself because you might have to do all your business in one day and then you don't have time for creating but once you do have time for creating set your space that is kind of a zen for you and make it more of your original purpose like your enjoyment um and i think that's really the big thing for me is kind of separating trying to separate those two those two worlds of work and creating um and to Ho you know, hopefully not go crazy because of work and <laughs> so, so yeah, it's really the two things, scheduling out my day and trying to separate those two worlds. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to use a dancer term and I know in music, you know, you come to, you have still points and even the silence within music. So in, in dance, I would say that, um, that theme has always stayed with me from from dance onto all the different um, aspects of my career and my living my life as a as a person who's a you know a daughter and a mother and a partner and a <clears throat> you know all of the things all of the roles that that I have um, that have given me experience. But I would say that the stress and the mental spiraling, the anxiety feelings. Uh, that can escalate come when I'm disconnected from my center. And so things happen that can throw me off. And if I can recognize, then I just need to bring myself back to center. And sometimes that's just a breath. That may be all I have. Um, sometimes it's 
it's the you know it's it's noticing that I'm blocking the creative flow for me it's a lot about flow and letting energy flow flow through the body the mind um, if I'm blocking it with my own I think you said something that I, I want to pick up on about you know it's your creative flow and then it's also your your uh, your giving out and your, mm, yeah. and your and your helping yourself mm -hmm. but but what I find is sometimes uh, the perfectionism can block, you know, can create the anxiety of the not putting out or the not doing it, you know, feeling not, not good enough. So I, I think um, personally for all of the things that I've faced, it's, it's the fear of knowing what it's like to not be centered and I might never get back there and then calming myself down in the very many ways, um, which I think this is not the only talk on self-care that we can have, but through meditation, through bringing myself uh, quietly back, through connecting with good um, good support, supportive people that I have, those kinds of things, I'm always bringing myself back to my center, and you said purpose, so I would say intention. And for me, the, the best self-care tool is really learning how to deal with the inner dialogue that is constant in oh, yeah. all of us and all of the artists I've ever, ever treated or worked with. That is a huge, a huge issue. Um, yeah, we've got crazy shit going on. That's, there. it is intense in there. Um, but, um, yes. and for good reason, and for good reason, because you, as artists, put yourselves out there. It's not just a job that you can nine to five and forget about it's it's you it's your essence and so that's that adds um, a whole a whole level of things um, but I think attitude is also a very very key uh, tool so really having that centered quiet time to look at things to see how I need to bring myself back to equilibrium in whatever way that is and I, I just want to touch on this quickly because we're going to talk about your podcast a little bit more but I, I just noticed there was one episode where you had gotten off topic but it led to this really engaging conversation so it was like an interview within an interview uh, which is going back to what Anita was saying about putting ourselves out there as artists and you're, you're not just being judged and for getting up and performing, then you're expected to make people laugh as like as a comedian or yeah. or dance as a musician, you know. And um, there, you talked a little bit about this panicked response in in fearing that acceptance from the crowd and that kind of. Hmm. I wish I remembered that. <laughs> <a little bit. laughs> Part of my stress is that so many things happen on a daily basis that I forget my own life. <laughs> uh, um, no, I, I think I understand. Um, well, part of the, the fear about going out and doing stand-up is that your, your direct thoughts and how you feel as a human being are being judged by a whole group of people you've never met before, which is everyone's nightmare. And so I don't know why I do it, is my point. <laughs> But, um, and we were talking about purpose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. back it's to the purpose. purpose. And we were talking about like the looping and yeah. having this this cycle of thoughts repeating itself over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And you get home at the end of the night and like, well, did I play a good set? Did people appreciate this performance piece I did? Did they, you know, get the message I was trying to get across in my in my writing? And then how do you deal with that? I mean, I call it looping. You called it something else. Needed um, just that inner dialogue, yeah. yeah, and so that negative inner dialogue, but also just becoming so transfixed on one thing that you you just kind of like obsess about it, and it loops and it loops and it loops, and trying to write things out and tell your brain, yes, it's important. I'll deal with that in the morning. <laughs> so, do you, mind, do you mind if I add to that quick? Yeah. Just with the whole inner dialogue thing, as someone who suffers from mental illness too, like again, separating the two. Um, inner dialogue is like a crazy thing going on. Like you gotta literally talk to yourself. Like you gotta actually talk to yourself. I'm meditating yeah. is also key, <laughs> but like I'm not. You really gotta talk to yourself. You gotta convince yourself. Why am I doing this? What is the purpose? And I'm gonna keep going back to that because if you lose sight of that, your brain will start spinning, a hundred percent. Yeah, I I agree. And just 
on that. I feel like the, the better I've got, like, health-wise, I, I think, like, the more I've been going to therapy, the more I talk to myself in public, which is a weird thing. I don't know if that's just a me thing, or whether it's yeah, how many people it's here talk to myself. It's, 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 it's like, it's okay, basis. girl, you can, you can do this. Yeah. I feel like we're going to You have to get right with the people in here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think just to that inner dialogue point that there are specific, I mean, there are tools, there are strategies and tools of how you can talk to yourself differently or how you can change the conversation so that it's not a spiraling out of control uh, situation or even your self-evaluation after. If you, if you have the discipline to just go through you know, these three questions, um, like, what did I do well? What did I not do well? What do I do differently? And leave it alone. Yeah. You know, it's hard to things in perspective because yeah. the person who's like, who's in your mind is the meanest person. Yeah. <laughs> They're the most critical. It's because it's the yeah. perfectionism, yeah. I think. Which I, and, and sometimes that keeps you from actually going out and doing what you want to do because you it's where the okay. feeling of feeling backlog. Like you have yeah. so much inside you that just wants to come out into the world. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's it's that sense of um, the negative versus the positive. Mm -hmm. So it's um, stay focused mm -hmm. instead of don't get distracted. Mm -hmm. And so you're focusing on that. And of course you're going to get distracted if you're mm -hmm. thinking on that. So mm -hmm. those positive statements and that actually brings me back to Arianne's, uh, the podcast I was referring that she had gotten distracted from was all <laughs> about bullshit positivity. Mm -hmm. So um, you had touched, I mean, the topics on Arianne's uh, podcast and her blog, I mean, it goes from crisis control, serotonin, why it's important to deconstruct the portrayal of mental health issues in popular media. I mean, we could talk for a whole yeah. other hour Check on that one. We, <laughs> <laughs> but but it was a, a little bit about the pros and cons that you explored through this conversation um, and how positivity, a.k.a. yoga culture, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. self-help guru talks, you know, yeah. can help artists, but also how they hinder artists as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I just think that sometimes... Uh, like people can get uh, think that they're you know doing all the right things for their mental health, but actually not getting any better. They think that they're just you know I'm doing all the things, but if you're not actually conscious and intentional about what you're doing and um, like actually addressing uh, you know the things that are triggers for you in your life, I think that you're as long as you're not doing anything intentionally, you're not dealing with anything that has to do with your own mental health. You know. Uh, the, the whole thing about bullshit positivity uh, and the thing that I really liked about that episode was uh, sometimes people have this idea that like you have to be positive all the time to be mentally healthy, which is I think the most uh, unhealthy thing that you can do because that's not reality. You're not living in reality. That's a mistake. <laughs> it's wrong. Um, <laughs> Can we just feel yeah. shitty once yeah. in a while? That's the whole thing. Like sometimes you just have to admit that things are shitty, and then you kind of move on and just be on a human level. Stop shaming people into feeling bad all the time. Like I hate, and so many people hate when you're just feeling terribly, and somebody says, "Oh, it's all gonna be okay. It's gonna be fine. You're gonna get through this, whatever." And yeah, that's supposed to be helpful, but actually at the same time, it it kind of diminishes what you're feeling at the moment, and sometimes you just need to go through the motions of feeling terribly. Like, as I said, like sometimes horrible stuff happens. Sometimes you lose people in your family or, you know, just, you know, you lose a part of your identity. I don't know what, like it could be anything. And then you have to mourn it properly or else you're not really dealing with it. And then it just builds up into something else. Like you might think that you got through it, but actually you're just compounding it so that later on when you can't handle it anymore, it just blows up. So. That's like something that all of us probably have done in our lives, and eventually that like brought me to therapy in the first place because um, I didn't really think that I needed therapy for the longest time, and then I thought that I was gaming the system when I <laughs> I took advantage of my work benefits, and I thought that was like yeah I'm just gonna get the points on my card it's gonna be fine um, I don't really need this I'm just gonna take take advantage of it. And then I actually got help, and <laughs> I was like, wow, this actually works. So uh, 
the only person I was fooling was myself. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think the naming is is really yeah. important too. Anita, you've been working with spiritual paradigms for a, a really long time. How do you feel about that mindset of positive thoughts make positive things happen? How do you feel that helps and hinders artists and, and if it hinders a way that you deal with it? Well, I think that um, it's it's kind of known and, and actually physics supports that energy follows thought and that um, there's whole aspects of healthcare, neuroimmune psychology affecting your immune cells. So there is there's evidence that positive thought has a positive outcome. Uh, but I but I do agree that just that Pollyanna kind of you know rose colored glasses everything's gonna be okay is is a is a way of not coping actually. Um, so it's really about being present. I think a lot all the, the paradigms that I've studied are talking about realistic appreciation of what is. How are you feeling in this moment? Not even how you think you feel, but if you actually take a moment and how are you really feeling? You know, we make so many assumptions. Um, you know, uh, I remember a situation where someone passed away and, and everyone was like, oh, he must feel so terrible. And the person, I, I actually don't. I actually feel, I'm, I'm feeling elated. I'm happy for them. I'm relieved. You know, whatever it was. And it was just the opposite to what the social norm would have dictated. And that's very important, I think, to, it is important to be positive. It's important to, to find the silver lining in the negative. Um, we wouldn't even in those paradigms say this is good or bad, this is positive or negative. This is what is and what, do you, what purpose can it serve you? It's, it's an opportunity, just like an illness could be an opportunity and a challenge. Doesn't mean you brought it on, but it's definitely something to look at. And, and a lot of times it's about trying to get your attention. Something needs to change, and it's usually you. <laughs> and, and, and again, with the awareness and the naming, and I, I always joked a little bit about having uh, my, you know, getting comfortable with my dark side or my shadow self, and it's like I would rather recognize it and name it and have it sitting in the passenger seat next to me and kind of know what's going on and be able to have a conversation instead of it being in the back seat smucking me upside the head when I'm least expecting it and you know, going off the road. And there's so. a spiritual point to that is the compa compassion, true compassion for yourself to actually be present, to own, you know, this is, this yeah, is something like in my dark side. Yeah, your shadow side. It's but like, it, you, yeah, exactly, and and we need to we need to be able to look at that. I mean, that's where, to be honest, a lot of art gets created from, um, but not all. It's just I think that's just a, a kind of uh, a, a viewpoint of that. But it's important to be able to not go into self pity about it either. That becomes a whole other mental health issue. What's really important is if you can't be compassionate with yourself to to have a friend or talk in, in kind of spiritual paradigm, you know, to talk to an element, to talk to the water, to be, to be with the wind, to be with nature, to, to feel that you're supported and held so that you can, all your disparate parts can come back into a whole um, and that you can hold space for yourself. We're very good at holding space for others and hearing another with compassionate ears, not so much with ourselves. And um, a another point I just wanted to make when we were talking about musicians and the work of it, the perfectionism, you can look at the positive side, just to say there's always the both sides of the moon, always present. Um, you know, as musicians, you know about discipline and commitment and focus and all of those things. And so applying that to, to yourself and to your self-care it becomes it becomes easy because you have those skills. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to stay on the topic of the music industry just for uh, a period of time, especially because we're so lucky to have Sarah joining us tonight. Um, and I mean, Sarah, you're a musician, but you're also working with the Unison Benevolent Fund. Mm -hmm, yeah. So through, can you tell us a little bit just 
maybe Cole's notes about what Unison is, is about. Yes. Uh, and then maybe uh, mention just some of the issues that you've seen kind of becoming more prevalent uh, within the industry, especially maybe with like touring oh, or yeah. Yeah. payment, you know, those oh, kind yeah. of things. Those are exactly it. But yeah, the Unison Benevolent Fund is a really, really great organization and it services all of the Canadian music industry. So whether you're an artist or um, a manager or whatever you, you do to contribute to the music community um, here in Canada. So what we do is we provide two, two main services to get to the point and it's uh, free counseling services. So you can access a, a hotline where you get connected to um, a partner we go through called Morneau Chappelle. Um, you access, you get right to a counselor and then they um, basically put you in the right direction. Is this an emergency or is it not? Um, and then you get to, you get, a, I, th I think, ten, five to 10 hours on the phone paid for for you. And then after that, if you and your counselor decide, hey, you know what, I, this should continue, then we will pay for that as well. Um, and our second, our second main service is our emergency financial assistance. So the thing about being in the music industry and you know the, the main issue is being financial instability um, and no safety net, um, like benefits and uh, you know un unemployment. But so if something happens, like you get injured um, or some sort of illness or hardship falls upon you where you can't work or you can't play the gig, then you can't pay the bills. Um, so Unison there is to step up and basically get you back on your feet so something doesn't become a career ender for you or really, really detrimental. Um, so yeah, that's basically what Unison does. But to go back to the point of the main issues being faced in that is, is really the financial instability, um, especially for musicians. Um, people, they typically don't get paid or you get paid in drink tickets and things along those lines. Um, and, and that goes into touring as well. Touring is a mental strain as well as a physical strain. Um, and that is just cold, cold hard facts, right? And there's definitely ways to kind of minimize and help uh, relieve some of that. But that's the touring is just that. Um, so yeah, financial disability, touring, and just the overall stigma, <laughs> I think, about mental health, mental health and mental illness is still got a long way to go. Um, so people think, you know, the cool rock and roll lifestyle, right, is like this image, um, but really it's not, and it runs you down, and we really got to connect between the music industry and the music fans to understand that, um, you know, n not everyone's a robot, we, can, we are all human, and uh, there's, the, there's got to be some relief there, so yeah, that's, those are definitely the main issues, is we got to get paid. Gotta get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Arian, do you find the same kind of thing in the Very comedy much. scene? Like trying, you're getting paid in drinks, and there's if at this, all. <laughs> if at it, all, yeah. It's like that, except way worse. <laughs> it's not. It's non-existent, really. Um, we we don't get paid pretty much. Like um, comedy isn't even considered an art. It by Toronto or Ontario, you have to apply under some like nefarious means. You can apply under other disciplines, but it's not considered an art. So that's a, an issue that the whole community is kind of coming together with this year to sort of figure out. And so we can't apply for grants and stuff like that because which would help comedians uh, develop their art. Um, and even something like that is harmful to one's mental health when you're a comedian because you're like, okay, so what am I doing this for? It's not even considered an art. The government doesn't consider it an art, so it's like, am I wasting my time? Am I worthless type thing? And I think that it's a lot of us have, you know, some more than others, uh, like embrace that sort of like, oh, I'm just a comedian. Like it's just, you know, I'm a piece of shit type thing. And it's not true. Like, you know, like all artists, there's people who, less experienced and you know um don't take it as seriously and just take it as like you know it's they go to the open mics and that's as far as it'll go but you know people get a lot of pleasure out of comedy and going and watching comedy and laughing and um it's like all over netflix so there's like there's specials coming out all the time it is an art that people 
get derived ple pleasure from, and it should be supported. And you know, it's theatrical, and and, and you know, you could do so much with it. It has its own history. It's like new, but still, it's you know, it, that so that's a barrier as well. We don't get paid, which is another thing. But I think that producers within the scene, uh, and I think in different cities, are now starting to understand that that's a problem, and it kind of starts like with. Um, creating your own spaces where you can uh, provide, uh, you know, paying opportunities and try to work with venues to compensate a little bit more and like kick in more money here and there. But sometimes bars, like, they have this idea that comedy as well isn't, you know, something that they want to be spending a lot of money on. Like, it's not going to bring a lot of people in, but it's like, you know, if you give people the opportunity to put on a good show, then they'll put on a good show. It kind of depends who the person is gonna be who's running it, um, but there are like tons of um, like black sheep comedy uh, is a, is a comedy you know they they do uh, shows in like pretty much every city and they they're like providing opportunities for comedians to get actually paid what they're worth like not just like you know twenty bucks here and there like what you would pay an artist to go and perform and sort of like elevating the the status of the art. Um, so it kind of starts like like that, I guess, right? But it's just how do you you know lift yourself lift yourselves up and like lift up the esteem of the art? So that's kind of a a problem that we have. Um, and and there's all, we were all, we're also building like an infrastructure now that's kind of like this, um, like Unison. Yeah, like Unison. Cool. Um, but it's it's very new. But it obviously so grateful to now have it in place because it's, you know, they just announced today, it's called CASC, um, the Canadian Association for Stand-Up Comedians, which Sand Sandra Badalini, uh, she spearheaded and she, uh, she has a new documentary called Mayor of Comedy that talks all about it. And like the, everything I just talked about is like mapped out in mm -hmm. that uh, documentary. But yeah, her organization is like fighting for the right for comedy to be be considered an art and then you know give us uh availability to services like like financial services and also like health benefits so yeah that was actually like um, different ways yeah of, like you said lifting exactly. yourself up and yeah. that's i wonder like when you get caught up in something like that where mm -hmm. it's just like we're we're not recognized we're not uh, equal to this discipline, to mm -hmm. this discipline, or even within the music industry of, you know, one genre over another is getting more attention. And I wonder, Anita, if you could talk a little bit in terms of lifestyle changes when you're treating people at the Artist Health Center, what are, are some of the tools when you do get caught up like that, or musicians who are touring, or artists who are traveling around installing and uninstalling art installations? Like, what are some of the steps that they can take? What are some of those tools that they can learn to ensure that their self care isn't the thing that's getting cut out of their daily life? It's a big question. <laughs> uh, well, there are many things that people can do, and a lot of them, we, we all know them, we know them, um, but we don't do them, and I think that's the problem yeah. right there. So I, you know, we, I could give you a list and send you the websites, and there's books on it, but I think the real crux is why, if we know something isn't working, or something potentially is gonna be a problem, on tour or whatever, why don't we do the things? that will um, minimize the, the detrimental effect to our health, to our physical health, our mental health, our emotional well-being. And I think you brought it up perfectly with it's, to me, in my experience, there's always an element of self-esteem. It always has to be, there's some piece, and it's not in our conscious mind, because most people don't go right away, yeah, I have poor self-esteem. <laughs> But it's, you know, if, if, if taking care of yourself is not just because you know it's good for you, but because it's an act of self-love, mm -hmm. self-care, I floss my teeth because my dentist told me is not very motivating. But if I realize these are my only teeth I'm going to have my whole life, I still may not. But if I, <laughs> you know, there's layers and layers. But if I have, you know... We actually work in such a way that sometimes when we've had a problem, that's when we understand the value. 
So if I, let's say I've had a problem with my teeth, then I realize, oh, I need to take care of it. And then I'm motivated. So I think self-love, so again, as you were saying too, going back to purpose all the time, you know, um, the basic things, sleep, eat, and exercise. And, you know, I can add to that, you know, good shelter and good relationship, good communication and feeling some support, some connection. Could be with your dog at home or your fish in the tank. It doesn't matter. And those things are, that's true. And they're also impossible sometimes on tour. So um, to be aware of them and to get it when you can. And I think that uh, I recently just taught something on self-care to dancers and they were amazed at how, you know, two minutes, two minutes can shift your whole day. Two minutes of, you know, looking at a menu and picking, you know, the, the most healthy thing on the no healthy menu. It's just, it's a consciousness and then that starts to um, kind of create some buzz. Also, I think that the culture itself you know, if you, I, I do know some some musicians that are <clears throat> at various levels quite famous that are actually now, you know, this, I go to bed at this time. I can only, you know, I'm going to be on tour, but I'm, we're off today, I'm going to bed. And I think you have to kind of be a pioneer. You have to be maybe the first one to take care of yourself so that others get permission because it might not be cool yeah. to not drink. Yeah, there's a, like, I'm sorry. just saying. I was going to say, lead by example. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, especially, like, in comedy, and I'm sure that in, um, like, in music as well, um, you, when you're getting paid freelance, like, you kind of want to do as many jobs as possible, but at a certain point, you're going to burn out, uh, and there's, like, so many comedians who will be doing 15 shows in a week, and that's a crazy amount of shows to me, um, and sometimes you feel like you have to keep up but then your energy might not be the same as somebody who's like 21 years old. So like you're, you feel guilted into doing something like that. So it's like creating boundaries and like, you know, how be like strategic about how you want to succeed and how you want to move forward. You don't have to do, you know, what the next person is doing. So you just don't compare yourself to those people, like do as much as you can handle and like, do only a little bit a day. Like sometimes you don't need to go over the board. Like you don't have to like meditate for an hour a day. Like it's cumulative. So you can, you know, if 15 minutes is all you can handle in the morning, then just do 15 minutes and or, like, or then two. you won't have, or yeah, two yeah. Minutes. It's, yeah. yeah, or two minutes, yeah. you know? I worked with a festival once who had mandatory meditation minutes mm -hmm. built into the day. That's so nice. twice a day so an alarm would go off and you took two to five minutes and it didn't matter what was happening, you just stopped. Does everyone just take like one moment right now, collectively, or just like take a big breath in? And I wanna go back to communication and boundaries, because I think, hence the breath, boundaries are so hard to communicate, especially when you're in the industry of um, you are people's release when you're an artist and especially performing artists and musicians. Um, what, what do you do when you are the party? So to be able to, to keep those boundaries in place, but also how to communicate them to those who are in the industry with you, but also to your fans. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely leading by example is a big thing because like you said, a lot of people are looking up to you and I'm not saying you have to like change your image or your like marketing or anything like that, but you know, ways you can, um, improve the lifestyle is for example, if you get offered drink tickets as payment, chances are there might not be a way around that because of sponsorship or what have it. Um, but you could say, Hey, listen, man, like I would actually prefer a case of water that would do me really, really good on the road because having a case of water in your van on the road is, is really important. Um, and so, you know, kind of say, is it okay if I get like a discounted food rate instead? And ch they could look at you like the hell and be like, no, <laughs> but at least you're putting it in their brain. Um, and you're sparking that conversation in your relations with, uh, work as a musician or as an artist, um, whatever it is you might be doing. 
Um, so, so really like it, and on, and touring is, is really hard. You kind of have to accept the fact that there's going to be times where McDonald's is the only thing that's open and, uh, pizza might be your only option. And it's hard if you're a vegan, especially, um, but, but you know, it's, again, it's choosing the, the best thing on the menu, pre-planning. If you have a hotel room, um, some nights you might have a hotel room, some nights you may not. Um, when you do have a hotel room, find the nearest grocery store and uh, get some healthy snacks for yourself. Um, that really does go a long way without breaking the bank. Um, as well as if, say, if you're sleeping in the van, which is quite common for us independent musicians, unfortunately, um, is to bring yourself like an electric frying pan which don't electrocute yourself, like just <laughs> put that out there. But, um, but you can, there's definitely ways to minimize, um, the, the hardship on the road. And, and is this, is this answering your question? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, there's just so many things I can talk about. There's so many tips. tips. It, it you should open up a Twitter page. Tips and tricks. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it, it actually leads into something I did want to talk about, which is how, venues and festivals and events and music labels can really um, support artists uh, when, they're, when they are being hired because I feel like that may be an avenue um, of education that is not as prominent. And you, you look at the press that um, the guy from Colorado is getting for his independent label because they implemented a mental health fund. So it's like $1,500, no questions asked a year to get whatever you need. If it's a yoga pass or therapy or, you know, anything like that. So what else can we as artists contribute to the education of people who are running festivals and events and venues and, and labels and how they can help? by being good humans and, and like valuing, <laughs> totally. treating them with respect. Like there's so many, I, and I hear about musicians as well because I'm, I'm part of the, you know, peripherally the music community yeah. and how so many festivals and bars won't pay. It's the same way that they won't pay comedians for, cause they just assume that we're all looking for work and we're desperate, but it's no, like we kind of have to take power back and be like, have boundaries on like, who we perform for and the venues that you perform for and the people you work with because they they can drain you of so much enthusiasm and energy for doing the things every day and so choosing producers to work with like you know wavelength pays their their artists uh, you know every single time other producers pay their artists what they deserve better than sometimes the bigger festivals that you know Somebody came uh, up to me after like a totally other um, music event and said, wow, it actually feels really good to be paid uh, like more than I got paid at like a Finger Eleven concert that I opened up for. And I was just like, how much did you get paid? And like, it was like not a lot at all, but it was still like validating to that person. It's like your time is valued for, you know, and you're bringing something to this event and you're you're appreciated. You feel like this kind of a star and like you, it's like building up that esteem of like you deserve to be paid for your time and your art and this is giving value to the world, right? Yeah, and I think outside of the financial compensation though, mm -hmm. um, in having, um, like wondering what else you can do on site. So for instance, if you are an artist who isn't drinking and it is this big culture of, you know, not necessarily being paid in drink tickets, but that that's where the party is, but there, there aren't a lot of dry areas happening. Um, are there anything like that you can think of that from the services that the Artist Health Center offers that could be incorporated into, you know, artists, Right. Self-care and wellness. Um, well, I was going to say about needs. So really knowing what your needs are and communicating them ahead of time so that it can be that it, you know, usually they're, they're, on, they're not that expensive to put in these needs. So for instance, you know, a quiet space, just mm -hmm. some room where people that need to introvert before they extrovert, which are many people that I, that I know and work with, including myself, you know, need a quiet space. Um, need to know that, um, 
you know, like you were saying, water's available or help dietary, res you know, choices are respected and available. Um, in terms of services, festivals, um, I know we've certainly, have certainly been on panels to educate at festivals, but on-site care would be fantastic. Just have so, like a resident you know, massage just therapist. Have, we have massage, Backstage. shiatsu, chiropractic, <laughs> acupuncture. I mean, and that's, that's, um, you know, I can't say enough about those. I could talk so all you're, night. You're, you're offering to I'm offering that. Treat. I have been, uh, I have treated dancers backstage, you know, to before and after just to, to um, help them prepare. So I think having the things that you need, and so that again is a responsibility to say, what is it that I need to take care of myself? Maybe I need yoga mats there because I want to be, I need to stretch and I'm not going to, have my yoga mat with me wherever I go. Just simple, simple things that um, those venues can provide with little cost to them that, that shows goodwill, you know. But I think it's, it's an interesting cultural thing um, where because you're not asked and maybe not respected, and I certainly know from dance how that is, but you ha unfortunately have to make the demand in a friendly nice way but this is what i need so that you change the culture and then there's the the gratitude and then it's like oh what can we do to make you more comfortable um maybe it's just even making sure that there's no media near you at a certain time or no no photos at a certain time or that you get to control who's who's coming back i don't i don't know i'm not i'm not uh, but but definitely that type of thing and these, these are Very resources easy. that are available. I mean, outside of being at a venue or at an event, um, but resources oh. that are available here in the city with... Yes. Oh, did you want me to talk about the... Yeah, that would oh, oh, be great. Okay. I think... Uh, All right. Well, we've we used to the term Arts available. Health Center enough, so I'll just tell you exactly what it is. Um, it is the only center of its kind in Canada. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about North America, but I, I would bet something on it. Um, it is a, a clinic that was started by grassroots artists who wanted a healthcare facility with practitioners that were either from the arts or very sensitive to artists' needs. Um, and they found, uh, they, they, they got a venue that was in a hospital. So it's a very unique situation where it's a clinic that services only artists and arts workers it is unique in that it's allopathic Western medicine. We have a nurse practitioner, we have medical doctors, um, we have access to all the specialties at the hospital and imaging, but we also have other, other um, paradigms there working together. So chiropractic, acupuncture, cranial sacral therapy, um, shiatsu, naturopathy, uh, massage, we have psychotherapy, we have psychiatrist, and we have um, medical psychotherapist. We have social worker, um, and I'm just getting in uh, with one-on-one -on -one kind of counseling. Um, so that is there for you. It's at the Toronto Western Hospital, and it's there for you. You can look online. We have a, the allopathic um, practitioners are OHIP only which is wonderful, um, but sometimes the needs go, you know, are holistic, and we work together. The other therapies are not, but there is a subsidy fund that um, uh, covers $750 a year, twice in a career, um, where you're, you're subsidized. So there's a fund uh, that's quite, quite healthy and um, covers, covers care, so it's a way of having benefits. Um, the social work psychotherapy one-on-one is, is free and uh, some of the groups run there's we have a wonderful medical director who runs a group uh, using restorative yoga mindfulness and other healing modalities and that is also OHIP only so it's quite um, it's 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 been around I don't even know maybe 16 years and it's still new to many has anybody here heard of it before? Okay. Yes. Oh, good. good. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, so um, we're all going there together. Yeah, so <laughs> I encourage you. I encourage you. 
encourage you. We really work as a team, um, sharing sharing knowledge, information, and treatment. It sounds like paradise. It's paradise. <laughs> it's fantastic. And we really, I would say in terms of this panel, um, just in terms of, you know, we offer all those things, but we're all very focused on no separation between mind, body, and spirit. And I particularly think that the, I don't know what word we want to use, but the spirit part is so important to to art, to artists. That's that's what it is, and um, I feel like that's what makes it unique. That we're we're looking at, uh, you know, all of you in context, in context of what you do, in context of you as a human being and as a, as an artist, as which is a special human being. Um, so. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to come and check us feed, out. Feed your spirit. Feed your spirit. Feed your spirit. Mm -hmm. And get your body healthy and mm -hmm. let your mind follow. Yeah. Um, before we open it up to q and A, I I just, I, I wanted to go back, um, because we didn't get to touch on it uh, as much as I would have liked uh, around uh, just artists working very um, actively in the community and advocating for mental health issues. Uh, DJSB, who played just around the corner a few weeks ago uh, at the Wavelength Brothers Dressler Show. She's a huge mental health advocate. Um, we have uh, Stefan Babcock from Pup, who's given tons of interviews. And you, you see a lot of this coming out where it's a lot of uplifting music, but it's lyrically and musically kind of hitting the nail right on the head now, whereas before it may have been a little more cryptic. So I'm just wondering uh, what each of you, if you could offer a takeaway for the artists who are here for how to contribute to removing the stigma around that throughout, uh, within our own artistic practices. Yeah, um, I think if you have that messaging through your music, that is incredible because music is a subject to change historically. Um, it has always been a spark, it's always been, music has been something that, or art in general, stuff that pe sometimes people just aren't comfortable saying first, you know? And uh, so having that in your messaging and, and being positive towards your fan base and a, a, a kind of accommodating, like, listen, it's okay not to be okay kind of kind of thing, that's really great. If that's not part of your writing style, um, I would suggest doing what was mentioned before and uh, making your needs heard as an artist, and then the industry should, should uh, hopefully, which it is slowly, follow, um, because it, realistically, it's not the artist's job to make the industry a healthier place. Um, you know, the industry ourselves, we're here to, uh, help uplift the artists and give them their career. So it's really the industry's job to follow the need and um, and accommodate as, as it follows, like Royal Mountain Records and their fund for their artists. More Every single record label should have, have that. Um, every single company should have, and you can mention this too, if you're an artist and you, you even work in the music industry at all, you can mention this, like have some sort of, make sure your, your workplace has like a code of conduct in place or make sure your, your superiors are aware, like, hey, is there, so, is there someone I can talk to if there's an issue? Like, who, who do I go to if, you know, there's an issue I need to address? Um, yeah, having those resources available and making your voice heard is really, really, really the best thing you can do is just to utilize what's there for you and fight for what's there for you because the industry is what needs to follow and sometimes it just takes a really long time. It really does. Like 1% every day, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, and like I think that the, thing, the reason things become stigmas is because nobody talks about them and understands how rampant they are throughout all society and like usually, you know, when you're holding something inside, you think that it's like, I don't know, taboo, or like, I shouldn't be talking about this, like, nobody's gonna understand, like, way more people understand than you think, so, um, maybe run it by, like, your inner close circle first, and then, um, like, share more publicly, but I, what I found by going through the, the pod therapy, and then the podcast, is that, 
Um, so many people relate to the, you know, pretty much any topic that you can talk to, there's like an audience for it, you know, and um, talking about it more often sort of releases the shame and guilt of having to deal with these issues like of anxiety. Like nobody used to talk about anxiety before, but now everyone's talking about it and now everyone has it. So, you know, <laughs> like everyone's anxious. We gave it you know? a name. We got it. It's not, a, it's not stigmatized anymore. It's hilarious because we all have it and we were all keeping it a secret for so long, but who knew? It was there the whole time. Uh, <laughs> The, like things like that like you don't like it disempowers it almost and it makes it less you know I should be ashamed and guilty that I I'm the only one experiencing this and then also it lets the government or like the, the structures the organizations know that oh this is a problem that we now need to deal with it's not like they were you know they wouldn't have thought about it first because they were they're humans too so why would they think to you know create structures for that so the more we talk about it and create like no, we actually need this. Like this is, like it's you know big enough problem that they, we need to address now, and that's why things like you know unison, unison and um, you know cast get created is because now we are actually starting to talk about the things that we actually need. It's like the need, the needs, just speaking up about what we need, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, creating a healthier relationship with ourselves and our community. Yeah, ah. so it's so interesting. <laughs> It's yeah. so interesting about the conforming and belonging. Yeah. You know, first we, we don't want to connect on that level, and now we all want to belong to the anxious club because we all, we all have it. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I, I think it's very interesting kind of bringing it full circle to mental health and mental illness um, that things that are kind of, I don't like to use the word normal, but within our experience, within our it's. Within our experience, I don't know a performer that doesn't have some anxiety before going on, or, or you know, it's part of it. But it's not normalized; it's pathologized, and then you think you're you're weird or you're the only one. And so I I was at a conference on um, um, performance science, and it was based on musicians, and they were debating academically on whether there should be a separate uh, disorder called musicians' anxiety disorder, and I, I was appalled and sad. I was just, what? It's you know, if it's part of, it's part of, you know, from your first piano lesson to all the way up, it's part of, it's part of the the experience, and that we need to put that into the educational uh, levels that it's part how you handle stress and and that there is stress i think the whole mystiques i think things are coming down all over the place um and the mystique of the perfection and whatnot so i i i corroborate and agree with uh, my my colleagues here that i was just gonna say communicate 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 to yourself communicate to your inner circle communicate in your art um, and it, and you will um, it'll dissipate and things get created from that communication. Uh, so I would like to uh, open the floor up to Q and A. Um, we have the Facebook Live on, so we're gonna say goodbye to all our Bye. online friends. Bye. Um, so Bye. that way we can have a, a really safe space to open this up to discussion. I'm gonna attempt not to have my back view as much. I'm so yeah. sorry. Um, so if anyone uh, would like our panelists to elaborate on anything that we've talked about so far, or perhaps there is a topic that we didn't uh, get on that you would like to discuss, these are remarkable women who, uh, to each their own, a and we're all wearing to glasses, you. so you can trust us. <laughs> we're, we're we know smart. what we're talking about. <laughs> I only got the glasses, so I would be taken seriously. But specifically for this event. There's no prescription. I had them no. So, any, does anyone want to open oh. things up? Yeah, I, like, any questions maybe about, like, you know, life on the road, I'm great for that, like, um, 
Any, anything, guys. Yeah. We'll, we'll how, how do you sleep space. in a van? Oh. And get a good night's sleep so that it doesn't make you an irritable, horrible human being the next day. And Very carefully. <laughs> uh, memory foam. <laughs> um, sleep, sleep is a tough one, I gotta say. Sometimes it's about uh, removing yourself from, you know, you gotta do the show, you gotta sell the merch, you gotta talk to the people after, and then kind of being like, look, Okay, fans are trying to drive me, buy me drinks, that's cool and all, but you know what? No thank you. I'm gonna go back to my van and yeah. and and wind down. And just just be <laughs> recognizing that it's not uncool to take care of yourself. And I think that's a big problem with um, especially men in our industry. It's like cool to not do self it's not cool to, to do self care. Does that make sense? You know, but it's or so it's like, or it's cool to be busy all the time, and yeah, you yeah. know, they you're like counting your emails. Like when I was working corporate, they would literally like if you came back from vacation, and um, you'd either be bragging about how many emails were in your inbox or something, or like you're working the entire time you're on vacation. That's not really a vacation to me. Um, I just think that it's like when you're freelance, you have less boundaries on what your structure of your day is like, so you feel like. It feels like you know you're working less because you don't have the structure to, like nine to five, but actually you end up working way more because you're like, you know, you don't have you don't have those disciplined hours, so you kind of have to create them yourself. And um, I struggle with workaholism too because I'm like, you know, you when you run events, you have to promote events, you have to be talking about it all the time, you have to be preparing for them, and it just feels like when you take even a moment's rest, you're like, oh, what could I be doing right now? Um, and you're always thinking. So I'm, I'm definitely guilty of that. So it, it's so like you're like self-medicating through working more. Yeah, because it feels sometimes it just feels like you, that's what you have to be doing, but it actually you don't have to do that. You can just take a break sometimes, and that's why I I actually schedule it into my calendar now. Like if I have like nothing going on in a day, then I'll do like self-care thing number one like maybe it's just take a bath or something but it's like in the calendar so i know i'm a virgo guys like this is a <laughs> classic everything must be scheduled <laughs> um i just wanted to yeah. touch to um just with anita and sarah uh, sarah has a list um we have a stack of papers and it has a long list of the resources that are available here in Toronto. And uh, just one thing I, I didn't touch on, um, just when I said self-medicating, that seems to be something that happens a lot in arts and entertainment, where a lot of people are self-medicating to deal with mental health issues that arise. And I'm just wondering, I, this could also be a whole separate panel, but I am wondering what the resources are, that are available um, through Unison, uh, through the Artist Health Center, and if you don't offer um, tools or services, um, if there might be some that are on that list as well. Yeah, yeah, well, I think the list that I made is a lot of different organizations that are just, are good to be aware of, um, but with Unison, like I, there's this, there's the hotline that's available. So if you if you need kind of like almost a sponsor, right? Like let's not get into the AA stuff necessarily, but like you're having an issue and uh, you you need to just maybe you can't talk to your bandmates about it because they're all getting drunk, right? It could it, it's quite possible. So you could access the hotline. It's an immediate pick up on the phone. Hey, look, I'm having I really really need help. I'm I don't want to partake in X, Y, Z, whatever tonight, and it's it's there, and I'm having a really hard time. What are some coping strategies? Um, and then that way you're talking to a professional and not necessarily a bandmate who might be half in the bag already. Um, so with Unison, the hotline is really huge, and it's a resource that everybody um, should be using if you work in the mu in music, um, as well as this is can be something that people can benefit from if you don't work in music too. But we do upload every Sunday self-care blogs and some of them have lots of different topics like um, how like how to stay healthy on the road or how to, different uh, things you can do to um, eat healthier or what are what are some ways you can cope with the, the stress or performance anxiety and things like that so those are some also really great reading tools uh, that anyone can look at and and 
probably benefit from. Um, and so I suggest going on our website and checking out the blog posts as well. Yeah, they're, they're great interviews. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and, and Cassandra, um, who works with like she wrote and writes most of them. So. I, think, I think I stole two of her questions, actually, <laughs> from the, the East Pointers interview. They, oh, yeah. they talk a little bit about um, dealing with the mental health issues surrounding, you know, being on the road a little yeah. bit. So, and there's yeah. also the whole post, like post tour depression thing too, right? Which is a big thing um, because you all of a sudden have to get back into your day job and and resume normal life that you've just been completely separated from. So that's there's also some resources and some reading tools on that as well. So if you're if you find that's an issue for you, which it is for everybody, um, then there's there's definitely Definitely some good reading reading tools out there to help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right. are there um, any addiction mm -hmm. uh, treatment at um, the Artist Health Center as well in the event? Individually. Yeah. There's, you know, we don't have a program per se, mm -hmm. but um, acupuncture can address that. And we also have a drop-in de-stressing free acupuncture um, clinic. So that's it's amazing. I don't know what yeah. they do. I don't know the science behind it, but all I know is that when I tried acupuncture for the first time, I was having some crazy dreams, <laughs> and it was like, it was unlike anything that I'd ever experienced wow, before. Amazing. Yeah, it gets a creative juices flowing. I don't know what to tell you. It's, a, it's great. A but depends when you need yes. <laughs> Whatever it hurts. I mean, there's, there's, oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. There's, there's uh, cycles to be broken, mm -hmm. so that acupuncture can help with that, can calm the mind. All the physical techniques, that, all the therapies that we have are also um, addressing mental issues. Um, trauma is a big thing, post-traumatic stress. Um, so a lot of people think about they they have to just come and talk about it, mm -hmm. but there are many techniques that we have to calm the nervous system down so it's not as easily triggered, and then then you can get a handle on the healing. And I'm gonna so, swing by and yeah, 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 swing by. <laughs> I think that um sorry I don't know if this fits in. I'm sorry, uh, but I, the thing that I wanted to talk <laughs> about was like the tortured artist mm -hmm. sort of idea that the idea that if you help yourself you won't your art is going to disappear your music or whatever you create your comedy is not going to get is going to suffer from it um i think that that's like it's it's such a myth i think it's because it, you're you're scared of change you don't know what's on the other side so how can you even assume that that it would be reality um and i think that maybe some people just have to go and and you know they self-medicate because they think that you know um, this is where it comes from, right? It's like, you know, I'm I'm drinking, I'm becoming less inhib like inhibited or whatever, and um, I can speak my. That's how it is in the comedy scene. Like sometimes people will you'll be under the, the impression that you have to have a drink before you go and like become vulnerable that way, and sometimes like you're you're saying things and like you're getting it off your chest, but you aren't actually dealing with you know that trauma, so you're kind of just like in you're doing like the same jokes over and over again, you're rewriting them and like, it's just like you're re performing the same set like throughout your entire career for some people. And like, wouldn't it be so much more interesting to evolve as an artist and like, you know, see, you know, w how your art changes as you change um, and not be so scared about, you know, what's, you know, what's on the other side. But I think that it's such a personal thing. Like for me, I just felt like in the, <laughs> in the throes of my quarter life crisis, I was like drinking and doing drugs as one does in their mid twenties. And I was like one of these at that stage where it was like, this is, um, you know, the chaos is where everything comes from. And like, that's where your the hilarious jokes come from. But also it's like it's, um, a self-fulfilling prophecy and you things just get worse, I think, or like they'll just, they won't get better. And so you'll just hit a point where you're like, I just like I want something to change. I don't want it to feel so bad all the time. And then you can actually be funnier and more clear-minded if you are, you know, doing things to help your your life, right? And you're you're having new experiences all the time that are, you know, not uh, drinking related. They're not now not anymore about like you know being promiscuous and stuff. But it's like new experiences, and that's finding the the creative 
challenge in that and like overcoming it and like trying to be interesting is like more interesting than uh, just staying the same person all the time to me. Embracing growth. Yeah, but uh, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to jump in there right over, but I wanted to yes. just Thank do you. a Thank shout you for out. Me. Yes, I, I hear you and that's uh, totally true. Um, just about medication though, because um, you know, it has its place. And, um, and so coming to the Artist Health Center, there are medical doctors, psychiatrists that can prescribe whatever is needed. And I think that some, you know, there can be, um, there can be shame in, in taking antidepressants or something else. And, and for me, I think, you know, you need to break the cycle of pain. However you help yourself stop, so that you can be in a place enough to deal with, to deal with cause, to deal with issues. So I think that's very different than self-medicating, which is sometimes um, you know useful for creativity, but sometimes also just a way of kind of numbing out or or closing down and doesn't really change anything. So you can reduce pain, but you don't. You don't change anything. Yeah, and being scared of those like yeah. negative emotions. Exactly. Someone once described it to me as um, the metaphor of like trying to cross a brook, and would you take someone's hand that's going to help you get across, or are you going to slip and slide on the rocks and and try and just get through it on your own? So sometimes there's mm -hmm. hand reaching out. So to I think take. It's also important to not be shameful and not be too preachy too, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, especially in the music industry right now, there's a lot of, like, people are starting to be aware they shouldn't drink so much, and they, they're starting to be more aware of their, their health um, and how it's an industry of functioning alcoholics, basically. Um, and I think it's, it's okay to, you know, go back to the whole typical everything in moderation thing. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're going to slip up sometimes, and if you're in recovery from whatever it is, if it's substance use or mental illness, if you're, you're always in recovery, you're going to, you know, you don't, don't shame yourself for partaking in some things, like if you mm -hmm. want to have that, that drink ticket or yeah, sometimes you want to smoke that joint or something, like, you know, you, should, you shouldn't shame yourself, but you should under, be able to listen to your body. Um, yeah, somebody Probably. told me once or on the podcast that it's like maybe having certain situations where you do, you'll allow yourself, you know, it's not exactly. like, a, you know, you're not shaming yourself, but you'll do this when you're celebrating or like in certain circumstances. So building structures around yourself to allow, like, you know, you don't want to feel restricted, right? Like that's also your mental health. Like you, you want to feel like you have agency. Yeah, you and gotta, so if that's part of it, you gotta try you know, to build your structure and your non-structured yeah. Industry. <laughs> yeah. It all yeah. comes back to boundaries. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions, so let's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to clarify about the wonderful uh, Artist Health uh, Medical Center that we are all going to tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, going right now. <laughs> so how does it work? It, can anyone say I'm an artist and get help? Like, That's it's a good a, question. There is a... Usually, unless you referred to a person in particular, so if you called and you wanted to see me, you could just come and see me. I would vouch that you're an artist because you're here. But um, <laughs> often you go through the nurse practitioner, and there is a questionnaire to actually see if you if you are an artist or not. And some I I don't remember the qualifications. It can okay. be that you you make a part of your living um, creating art. Um, something like that, that you are at a professional level, but so it's... Is that a comedy part of yeah, it? I think, I think it's no, a, for sure. some comedy website, it's exactly. a certain percentage of your income yeah, has to come yeah. from uh, arts-based yeah. activities yeah. for a period of two years or something, yeah, like, something that. like that. Yeah, something like that. And then the world is your oyster. Yeah. And then is it, like, for something as, as I guess, normal as seeing a um, psychologist, not easy to find if you don't have benefits. Yeah. Right. And uh, is that um, something that is treated as um, a preventative uh, practice there, or is it just like 
Um, that's Cap- a good question. Uh, a couple of sessions, or how does it work? Well, the psychotherapy and uh, all of the care. I mean, it's not. It's it's not long term in terms of years and years, mm-hmm. but it's not a couple of sessions. The the social work, uh, one on one single sessions are free and that's usually one maybe there's a particular issue you just need help with um i know that he does do a few more um there's a psychotherapist and that is just you know you go and you have maybe 10 sessions and you can come because you're well or you can become because you have an issue and um both are both are good reasons okay, so to come. it's case by case. It's case by case, yeah. yeah. Or you could come for a physical reason, and I might say, you know, I think we should solicit, get this person involved as a team approach. Okay. Or they might do vice versa. Does that answer the question? Mm-hmm. <laughs> It'd be like, I, I kind of went off on my own mind there. So it's hard to afford the services, though, like, because, <laughs> you know, because you want to be ideally seeing them, like, you know, regularly, right? Well, there's subsidy, so yeah. it's it it is limited. But you could see the psychotherapist with mm-hmm. the subsidy and be okay. paying. Um, I don't. So for me, I know mine. If you saw me for a half hour session and you had a subsidy, you'd be paying nineteen dollars out of mm-hmm. your own pocket. Right. You know, yeah. and it's yeah. subsidized by a fund. So, yeah. but there are there is uh, again, oh, we have covered therapist there there is a bit of a wait list but we are hiring people because there's this big demand mm-hmm. yeah the gentleman person on the stairs hi you had a question uh, my question was for Tom. Yeah. 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 yeah yeah Tom. yeah <laughs> that is i <laughs> uh so i thought um Mm-hmm. Um, I guess that's something that, like, I wanted to ask what how you foresaw unfolding. Like, do you think there's like a certain amount of years where comedy will suddenly be uh, accepted? I guess more by like grant bodies, and once mm-hmm. those grants come through, how do you foresee change in like the co- like the community mm-hmm. or culture of comedy? That how it happens? Because I know like with music grants right now, it's like catastrophic for some people. No, not catastrophic. That's the wrong word. <laughs> Astronomical. Incredibly good. Incredibly good. Okay, so not catastrophic. Uh, that's that's all just not Ontario. Ontario. Like, <laughs> oh, long, Great. Long, long, I'm glad to hear that. I hope that it would be the same for uh, comedians. Um, the comedy is art, like movement, is something that's been happening for like the last couple of years, like more so in the last year. Uh, and the theater center is, well, they had like a whole week where they, they did a whole comedy as art um, programming. So, and they're, they've added it to their residency, uh, you know, so they want to encourage people who in comedy to, you know, support them. And I think that that's a, like a important first step because it's like, how do you cross pollinate with other disciplines, right? Because usually stand up comedy is very siloed and you know, you work by yourself, you're not used to working as well with other people. <laughs> um, and mostly, you know, some stand up comedians and myself included, we like working alone, so that's great. But also I think that we have so much to learn from all the other disciplines, uh, theater as well. Like it's, we are performative, so it's like how can we make it so that people who want to come see comedy, like nobody wants to go see uh, stand-up comedy in the city as of now, but like that could change in the future. Like we can build shows in, a, in new ways that are, um, you know, it's not just somebody maybe standing in front of you um, delivering jokes as per normal, but maybe it could be like, I don't know, like a formatted slideshow thing, or I don't know, like something like you could be doing, ah, I, I'm hard pressed for ideas right now, <laughs> but um, just like umbrella term of like yeah. a multidisciplinary comedic Multi- yes exactly an experience a comedy experience Ooh, doesn't cool. it sound yeah. incredible yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah can I jump in on the uh, um, on the, the the comedy grants question yeah I think uh, like anything government funding is uh, 
is up to us. Mm -hmm. Like if the politicians uh, will say that there's no more money to create new programs, new granting programs, but the money's always there. Mm -hmm. They just have to hear from us that it's something that is worth funding. Yeah. Uh, like you need to speak to your elected representatives and say that this yeah. is a an art an arts discipline that is currently not being served by the current granting bodies. Yeah, and that's why I think so many comedians are like so happy that Sandra is like leading the charging cast and like being the voice of us and because she's got a loud voice, I can tell you, and she uses it for like this act, like being an activist and and I think that that's great because it shows that you can be a leader in comedy and you don't have to embrace this uh, notion that, you know, just I'm just a comedian, like that's not, you know, you can elevate it and you know, you, you're training a whole, um, you know, it's a young, young community of comedians that we have and like we're all sort of helping each other now and I feel like when I first entered into comedy, just did my toes in like five years ago, there was absolutely nothing and, and it was really scary to start. But now I feel like there's so many role models who are working on this and it makes it easier and it makes it, you know, um, like collaborating on shows is so much easier because you can you can tell who's really trying to make a difference and build the infrastructure and like sort of build up our esteem. Yeah, and create a um, new scene. Yeah, but I, I think that it will change in the next few years. I don't know how long it will take, but somebody told me the other day that it would be the perfect time now because the liberals are like a minority government, so they're going to try to like, you know, give more to the arts and like try to swing more votes for next next election. So like, just hit them hard now. The All, all of the arts, not just comedy, right? I think that goes yeah. too with, with mental health resources as well. Yeah. But Johnny was saying, I mean, speak, to your local representative and and make it known what you need and, and what you want so that you're getting the care that you deserve, that we all do. Looks so like we got another question in the back too. Ooh. Hey, question I, I'm my biggest critic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. yep. Right, there, there's a genuine desire for, mm, not perfection, but at least a four-star performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's talk about the fifth element, ego. Uh, <laughs> snap. Yeah. Is all this yeah. mental health stuff, is my, is that my me ego opinion working on it? Or? I know it's so hard to find a balance between those things. Um, yeah, I wonder if, Anita, yeah. you could uh, talk about the therapy um, that's available at the center and and kind of how that might be approached if an artist was was struggling with an issue like that would would when they come in would they be redirected to a certain type of therapy that's available or mm -hmm. is there is there a way to kind of go into these these are the issues I'm having x y and z so ego could be one of them or anything else really that that's that you're struggling with, and then they would assess what type of care you would be able to receive from that? Hmm. That's a good question. I think it would uh, definitely depend if what kind of, what you define as ego, first mm -hmm. of all, what the problem <laughs> is. And then each therapist, I mean, they all have similar approaches, um, but different. So one is a psychiatrist, and he has the ability to to use medication, but they're all they're all similar in terms of the um, they do work a lot with cognitive behavioral therapy to actually say okay you have an ego issue how does that how does that show up what it, what is the dialogue let's change try here's an exercise actually change the dialogue how does that make you feel so there's a there that's across the board with many of the of the therapists, including the physical therapy people that um, get involved in that. Um, I think they're very similar. The psychotherapist uh, is also a massage therapist. She uses something called sensorineural, so it's a very in, in the body um, approach. How is that feeling? Where are you feeling that? Let's change the feeling, let's visualization. So there's many approaches, and I, I'm glad you brought it up because I was feeling also, when we think about mental health, and, and this kind of bothers me uh, as a whole, and the resources, talk therapy is, is huge and important and frontline, but 
a lot of times um, you can understand something intellectually and you may have already emoted, but if the experience has not been shifted out of your body, it's still there. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I think like if you don't have awareness of that. You don't have happening. awareness. Yeah. So if you're approaching your mental health to be nothing physical, I, I think that that's, that's an issue. And I think that the paradigms are shifting at that the boundaries are down. And yes, we have to, you know, you go, you're acute, you've got this, you talk about it. But I, I think it's a disservice to, to our being and to your art and to your, to your ego and your oh, character ego and all of that to, to not realize how much power you, by approaching the physical, how much you can shift the mental. I, I do this exercise where I just say, can I do it now? Yeah. We just, okay, just sit in a posture that is um, very, you know, that is low, is depressed, is you're feeling crappy about yourself, you're anxious, just, just get into whatever that is. And then just, <laughs> yeah, bye bye. <laughs> And then just, just take a I minute. Spread. <laughs> everyone should man spread it. It's just really whatever. Empowering. No, the thing about man spreading is that everyone can do it. It's not just, it doesn't just belong to them. It's like, <laughs> we can do it too, and it's great. I do it on the subway all the time. So it's just great. feel in your body how, where you're compressed, or that you're compressed. Just feel what that feels like in your body right now. And close your eyes. And note, what, how are you feeling? What are your thoughts just in this posture? What is your energy like just in this posture? And then in this posture, take a deep breath and see what that feels like. If it moves, if it doesn't move. <coughs> Note when you're constricted and how you're feeling. Where your thoughts go. The color it looks like in your mind right now. And now... Do a physiological shift where you sit in a more aligned, upright posture without holding, just very open, present, and feel what that feels like physically. How does that feel in your body? And how has, what is your feeling state, your emotional state? What is your mental state at this moment in this posture? And now take a deep breath and see the difference. And then open your eyes and see, did anybody feel any different from one to the other? And that is so simple. So the, I rest my case. <laughs> Uh, thank you to all of our, our panelists uh, for joining us and for Aaron and uh, Johnny for having us here tonight and for you for coming and sharing space with us. So 